This is a kind of abstract puzzle that keeps many scientists awake at night. Is it possible to predict how three objects will orbit one another in a repeating pattern? Most of the time, you'll get the answer, no, as the interaction of three bodies only leads to chaos. But as we have become accustomed to, things are not so simple and straightforward. First of all, over the centuries since the emergence of this legendary problem, specific solutions have indeed been found. And there are not just a few dozen, but hundreds of them. Secondly, even the orbits of the planets in our solar system, which we associate with permanence and stability, are, in a certain sense, part of this legendary problem. Since this topic has gained so much popularity, let's explore what really lies behind the famous three-body problem and why the Earth, Moon, and Sun are one of the earliest known examples of this problem. Still unsolved, by the way. Yes, this problem is already several hundred years old. The three-body problem dates back to the time when one of the most famous Englishmen invented gravity. By the way, there should be a meme here about the Egyptian pyramids, which were apparently much easier to build since Newton hadn't yet invented gravity. In any case, the three-body problem emerged with the advent of classical mechanics and its application to the description of celestial bodies' motion. Even before Isaac Newton described the force that makes objects interact with each other, the astronomer Johannes Kepler had already made an excellent mathematical description of how these bodies move. In the early 17th century, Kepler tried to figure out the orbit of Mars, a task assigned to him by the astronomer Tycho Brahe, Kepler's teacher, who was known for his observations of planetary motion and precise measurements of their positions. Mars was the flaw in the dominant model of the universe at the time, which placed Earth at the center of the solar system, with the other planets orbiting it. Braha, by the way, was a supporter of the Ptolemaic model, where everything revolves around the Sun, which, in turn, revolves around the Earth. However, Kepler firmly believed in Copernicus's heliocentric universe, which correctly placed the Sun at the center of the system. But regardless of where and how the Sun and Earth were positioned, neither geocentrism nor heliocentrism could accurately explain Mars's orbit. Copernicus and other astronomers tried to describe planetary orbits as perfect circles. It seemed that it had to be this way because the circle is the ideal geometric shape, and the universe, obviously, had to be perfect as well. Kepler, too, was convinced of this, at least for some time. However, the longer he failed to make observations match expectations, the more he leaned toward orbits that were not perfect but somewhat stretched and flattened, ellipses. Finally, the planets behaved as they did in real life, and the difficulties in predicting Mars's orbit were related to the fact that its orbit was the most elliptical of all the planets. Thus, in 1609, Kepler published his new astronomy, in which he formulated his first two laws, and ten years later, another, the third, where he demonstrated the relationship between a planet's distance from the Sun and the time it takes to complete its orbit. Although Kepler did not know what exact force kept the bodies in their orbits around the Sun, his three laws played a crucial role in Newton's work on the law of universal gravitation. Newton understood that the orbits of objects in space depend on their masses. He first investigated the problem of two-body motion and completely solved it. By finding all possible solutions, known as orbits, he derived Kepler's laws of motion. In fact, even today, the version of Kepler's third law generalized by Newton forms the basis for most measurements astronomers make regarding the properties of the orbits and masses of distant objects in space. This, in particular, allows scientists to determine the masses of moons orbiting planets, the masses of stars orbiting one another, and other objects. But beyond that, it also helps calculate the orbits of celestial bodies in the solar system. Of course, for the greatest accuracy, especially when planning the orbits of spacecraft, modern scientists go beyond Newtonian mechanics and use the general theory of relativity. However, despite some limitations, Kepler's and Newton's laws remain sufficiently accurate for many applications in orbital mechanics within the solar system. That being said, it is important to talk about the limitations. For Kepler's laws to truly be derived from Newton's laws, the solar system would have to be slightly different than it actually is. For instance, if the hypothetical Earth-Sun system were a typical example of a two-body system, it would mean that both bodies would orbit a common center of mass, which should remain static. That is, if you want to predict the motion of the Earth using classical mechanics, the Barry center of the Earth-Sun system must be stationary. 
But that's not quite the case. In reality, while the Sun is the largest and most massive object, it still experiences certain accelerations or wobbles due to the other planets, especially Jupiter. In fact, Jupiter is so massive that the center of mass between it and the Sun is not even located inside our star. Moreover, the planets also affect each other, periodically pulling on one another and mutually disturbing their orbits. Thus, the gravity of the Sun is not the only force governing the motion of planets and other objects. This means that the planets do not have the elliptical orbits they would have if they were solitary bodies orbiting the Sun. It would, of course, be simple to calculate the orbits of each body in the solar system if their motion were just the interaction of their mass and the Sun's mass, but the real universe avoids such simplicity. Therefore, calculating the two-body problem for objects in the solar system does not provide an exact solution, meaning you cannot precisely predict the orbit of any planet. Consequently, Kepler's laws are only approximate, and the fact that they work reasonably well for describing the solar system is largely because all planetary masses are very small compared to the Sun, the dominant force in our system. So, to accurately predict orbits, perturbations need to be taken into account. This is what astronomers focused on when trying to explain the unusual orbit of Mercury, or, for example, Uranus. And while things turned out to be more complex with Mercury, one of the greatest triumphs of celestial mechanics and perturbation theory, in particular, was the discovery of Neptune in 1846. It is the only planet whose existence was predicted before its discovery, based on the gravitational perturbations it exerted on Uranus's orbit. Of course, the Earth-Moon system should not be considered an ideal example of a two-body problem either, as the orbit of our satellite is significantly influenced by the Sun's gravity. Our star causes the Moon to periodically move closer to and farther away from Earth, essentially altering the eccentricity of the satellite's orbit. At certain points, the orbit becomes more elongated, or conversely, more circular. Additionally, the Sun's gravitational field causes what is known as the precession of the perigee of the Moon's orbit. Simply put, the orientation of the ellipse gradually shifts with each new revolution, as shown in this animation. The full cycle, or period of such a shift, lasts just under nine years. But that's not all. There is another very important precessional movement of the Moon's orbit for which the Sun is responsible, the shifting of its nodes. You see, the Moon's orbit has a certain tilt relative to the plane of the ecliptic, which is the plane of Earth's orbit around the Sun. Specifically, this angle is a little over five degrees. This, by the way, is the same tilt that prevents us from seeing solar and lunar eclipses every month. Thus, during its orbit, the Moon appears to leap out of the ecliptic plane and dive back into it, surfacing on the other side. The points where the Moon crosses this plane are called the lunar nodes. Now, since the Moon's orbit precesses, so do its nodes. But due to a certain angle to the plane of the ecliptic, they do so somewhat differently because of additional perturbations from the Sun. Don't worry, it's not that hard to understand. The Sun, of course, always lies in the ecliptic plane, as its rotation creates this plane. At the moments when the Moon is either above or below the ecliptic plane, the Sun pulls it toward itself, and logically, this perturbing acceleration is directed toward the ecliptic. This effect is strongest when our satellite is closer to the Sun than Earth. Essentially, this tendency to pull the Moon toward the ecliptic means that the lunar nodes, or the points where the plane is crossed, will shift. The full cycle of their precession takes just over 18 and a half years. Moreover, the nodes move in the opposite or retrograde direction to the Moon's orbital movement, meaning they shift westward while the Moon moves eastward. As you can see, the perturbations are quite significant. And although most of them are periodic in nature, making the system seem more or less stable, over time, scales of thousands or millions of years, all these perturbations can lead to long-term cumulative changes. This means that the Sun not only causes the Earth-Moon system to experience periodic deviations, but also gradually shifts the system out of balance. But why? Because Earth and the Moon are not a classical two-body system, the Sun's influence makes it more of a simplified three-body system, and when you have such a system, there is always room for chaos. 
So, taking into account the solar perturbations on the Moon's orbit brings us to one of the restricted three-body problems. Alternatively, this system can also be considered as a slightly more complicated two-body problem that can be solved. However, to ensure the solutions closely match observations, all of these perturbations from the Sun, as well as those from other planets, must be taken into account. It's also necessary to consider the non-ideal spherical shapes of both Earth and the Moon. This problem of predicting the Moon's position has been known since Newton's time and is still being studied by astronomers today. The same can be said about predicting the orbits of the planets in the solar system, which can be described as an n-body problem, meaning more than two bodies. Nothing in the solar system is as eternal or stable as it may seem at first glance. Saturn tore apart one of its moons during the time of the dinosaurs, which gave it its rings. Neptune will do the same with Triton in a few million years. In 1996, Jupiter's gravitational influence on comet Hale-Bopp shortened its orbit around the Sun from over 4,000 years to less than 2,500 years. So, from the perspective of mathematical chaos theory, the movements of celestial bodies in our system are indeed chaotic. However, this planetary chaos occurs over such long periods that it's hard to compare with a human lifetime. But sooner or later, someday, you might observe Venus in a completely different place on its orbit than current predictions would suggest. And over extremely long periods, measured in billions of years, one or more planets might even cross the orbits of others, leading to collisions. This wouldn't happen because of some random, unpredictable perturbations, like a collision between Venus and Eros, as depicted in a famous book. It's simply due to the fact that the interaction of three or more bodies in a system always involves some element of chaos. The classical three-body problem occurs when three interacting objects have roughly equal masses and therefore exert approximately equal influences on each other. In such cases, the motion of the objects becomes unpredictable quite quickly. But what does this mean? It means that there is no general solution to this problem. In other words, you cannot take some equation and using a series of mathematical operations, calculate the exact positions of the bodies at any given time in the future or past. Moreover, the initial positions of these bodies never repeat themselves. There is no general solution to the three-body problem. However, this does not mean that each specific case, that is, each specific system, cannot be examined individually and its future orbit calculated. So if you do know the exact positions of each body, their masses, and velocities, mathematics will allow you to do this. Armed with a powerful supercomputer, you can generate approximate positions of these bodies at a certain moment in time. The accuracy you need will depend on the computing power of the machine and the time you have available. So, in essence, for your specific problem, such as calculating the future position of the moon, you can make the approximation as accurate as you want, or as your resources allow. This is particularly important for planning spacecraft orbits. In fact, modern scientists have become so skilled in their calculation algorithms that they can compute quite precise evolutions of systems containing tens or even hundreds of thousands of particles. This is especially useful for modeling structures like galaxies. Calculating the future positions of stars is significantly more complex than in the solar system. Astronomers can also compute the fate of galaxies during their interactions, or even mergers, Moreover, values of n in the billions have been used to model the formation and evolution of galaxies in the early universe, a kind of problem of billions of bodies. Of course, such calculations cannot be considered the most accurate, especially those that model large time spans, but they still provide a general picture. However, it's important to understand that even though a solution can be found for a specific system, this is not the same as solving the n-body problem. Regardless of how accurately you can calculate the position of Earth in the year 2456, you cannot do so using a simple finite equation. However, there are, of course, certain exceptions, or, if you will, workarounds. In fact, the three-body and multi-body problem does have specific repeatable solutions. In other words, three bodies can indeed form stable configurations, but under certain well-defined conditions. Some of these were discovered by the famous German mathematicians Leonhard Euler and Joseph Louis Lagrange. Euler and Lagrange sought to simplify the task and assumed that one of the three objects had such a small mass compared to the other two that its gravity could be neglected. 
With these assumptions, they were able to identify five points of equilibrium. If the third body, which, as a reminder, has infinitesimally small mass, is placed in these points, the system remains generally stable. These points are now known as Lagrange points, although in fact the first three were found by Euler, and Lagrange expanded on his work by discovering two more. The first three points, usually denoted as L1, L2, and L3, also called collinear points, are located along the line connecting the two massive bodies. In the Sun-Earth system, L1 is within Earth's orbit, while L2 is beyond it, both about 1.5 million kilometers from our planet. In these places, the gravitational forces of the two massive bodies seem to cancel each other out. For example, we are used to objects closer to the Sun orbiting faster than those further away. But at L1, Earth's gravity prevents objects from having a higher orbital speed. Earth kind of pulls them toward itself, slowing them down and negating part of the Sun's gravity. At L2, it's the opposite. The orbit should be slower, but Earth's gravity pulls the objects along with it, maintaining overall orbital synchronization. Thus, these points are excellent havens for spacecraft. L1 is ideal for studying the Sun and its activity, while L2 is a great place for observing the wider universe. This is where the James Webb Space Telescope is stationed along with other past and present missions. In fact, points 1, 2, 3 are points of unstable equilibrium, meaning the slightest push will cause an object to leave this point and begin orbiting around it in a horseshoe orbit. Meanwhile, points 4 and 5 are truly stable, and objects there generally remain for a long time. For example, Jupiter's L4 and L5 points are so stable that they host a huge collection of asteroids known as Trojans. For millions of years, these rocks have followed Jupiter as it moves around the Sun. Earth also has a few small Trojan asteroids. Of course, Lagrange points are not the only types of general solutions to the three-body problem, and currently, there are, let's say, quite a few of them. For example, in 1993, American physicist and mathematician Chris Moore found a solution for three equal mass bodies that chase each other along an orbit in the shape of a figure eight. This also sparked the discovery of many new orbits for the n-body problem with equal masses. This family of orbits is called choreographies. From 2013 to 2014, several dozen more families of solutions were discovered, examples of which you can see on the screen. And from 2017 to 2018, Chinese scientists found over 2,000 periodic orbits, some of which involved bodies of equal mass, while others had different masses. Finally, in 2023, a group of Bulgarian scientists reported a staggering 12,409 orbital models that work within the laws of Newton and involve three bodies of equal mass. So, tens of thousands of different solutions for a problem that supposedly has no solutions. But there's always a but. Even when we have individual solutions with a specific set of initial conditions, this does not mean that such conditions can be reproduced in nature, except perhaps for the figure eight orbit. In the three-body problem, the initial conditions play a crucial role. Even the slightest deviation from these initial conditions leads to chaos. Therefore, all these thousands of orbits that are stable on paper are not necessarily realizable in the actual universe. We don't know for sure, of course, but the problem is too delicate and the initial conditions need to be too precise. So how relevant all of this is for astronomy remains an open question. And although in the original book, the inhabitants of Trisolaris come from the Alpha Centauri system, in reality, our closest neighbors, if they do indeed exist, certainly do not face the same problems depicted in the series or described in the book. After all, I hope it's clear by now that even we live in a world governed by the three-body problem. <laughs>